Welcome back, everyone, for the fourth and final panel of the day, titled EU Latin America Partnering Up with Mercosur. Our discussants for this last panel are Nicholas Albertoni, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Uruguay, who will be joining us online, Eleonora Catella, the Deputy Director of International Relations for Business Europe, Antonio Lopez Isturiz White, a member of the European Parliament for Spain and Secretary General of the Centrist Democrat International and also the Secretary Treasurer of the Martin Center. And finally, Sandra Rios, the Director of the Center for Studies in Integration and Development in Brazil. The panel is moderated by Luis Blanco, the General Coordinator of the Centrist Democrat International. The panel will last one hour and we also have a cocktail reception planned at 5.15. Thank you, enjoy. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this last panel on EU relations uh, or the partnership between European Union and Latin America, specifically with Mercosur. Uh, let's first thank the Martin Center for supporting us. Uh, Martin Center has been one of the few organizations here in Brussels that has been dealing with Latin America, which is a pity, but thank you, the uh, Martin Center, for, for bringing this topic. Uh, and also on behalf of the Centrist Democratic International, thank you for having us. It's a very good cooperation that we have been establishing the last years also with the Martin Center. So, uh, we have already presented our speakers. Uh, also from Uruguay, we are connected. Uh, as you know, in the last days, weeks, if we, I even would say months, uh, let's say the headlines about the relations between the European Union and Mercosur were not necessarily the most positive one. Um, in the last weeks also with the protests from the farmers, again, the topic came to the headlines. And let's say that there is not a very put a positive uh, atmosphere regarding the future of this agreement. If you allow me, uh, I will just do a very short recap because not necessary. We, we know if people are, you know, used or know the history uh, of these relations, uh, European Union Mercosur. So allow me to just in two minutes to do a very short recap so that you can understand where we are and what we are discussing today. Uh, as you know, the Mercosur, the common market of the southern countries uh, in, Latin Amer in, in South America, was uh, established in 1991 between our, uh, among Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. And since the beginning, the relationship with the European Union was very, very positive, and the cooperation has been very positive. In 1999, so I was a teenager, uh, they decided to start negotiating an association agreement. Fast forward to, 19, uh, to 2019, uh, suddenly everybody's caught by surprise because finally we have positive news. We reach an agreement in principle uh, between, uh, uh, negotiated by the European Commission with the Mercosur counterparts, but uh, an, an agreement in principle of the chapter on trade. And surprisingly, suddenly a tsunami of rejections. Uh, the, all the comments from member states, from lobby organizations, everywhere are suddenly very critical of the agreement. One month after this announcement, for example, the Irish parliament uh, passed a motion uh, saying that they would not accept this agreement. Uh, President of France Macron also made very big announcements that he did not see the future of this agreement, also during his very strong dispute with President Bolsonaro in Brazil. Uh, the Walloon Parliament here in Belgium and other countries like Austria also followed suit. The negotiations kept going. In 2020, there was the announcement that an agreement of the partnership and cooperation pillar is uh, uh, achieved. And suddenly, then other countries also start to showing their, let's say, doubts about the, the, the agreement. Even Germany, which was very, a country very supportive of the agreement, starts you know, showing some doubts. Also the Polish, also in the Netherlands. And suddenly we start a hiatus where for the next two years, nothing's gonna happen too much. Uh, they will start this legal scrubbing and the translation that takes longer than the negotiation of the Brexit deal. And we don't hear anything again about the Mercosur deal. Then suddenly we have our wake up call, uh, the war in Ukraine, the illegal Russian invasion. And suddenly again, it seems that the topic pops up again. We realize that our geopolitical interest is to 
uh, strengthen our relationships around the globe. Uh, the European Commission starts working very strongly to reactivate this agreement, uh, and these negotiations resume. Uh, but uh, still a lot of doubts and concerns about this agreement. Uh, some of them relating to the climate concerns, some of them relating to the impact of some products the trade liberalization would have in some countries. So it's decided that we need an interpretative protocol to this agreement that would maybe clarify uh, some elements which were not clear. Uh, in 2023, last year, the, this agreement is leaked to the press and again, all lobby organizations come, you know, and start saying that this is not doable, it's not enough, we are not going to make it. But we have some positive uh, news from Latin America, uh, some optimism because uh, President Lula comes, he's not Jair Bolsonaro, so maybe we can talk to him. And he comes with an agenda saying that in the near future we will have an agreement. Everybody's expecting that during the Spanish presidency, during the eu -SELAC meeting that was, took place in July last year, we might have uh, some announcement. This never happens. Uh, and then pressure mounts from the Mercosur side, the new president of the pre temporary presidency of Mercosur, newly elected president of Paraguay, uh, Santi Peña, says that if we don't have an agreement by December, it's over. But then the deadline expires, we keep negotiating. Uh, and now negotiations are still taking place, the rounds of negotiation. But some weeks ago, uh, as the former supporters emerged, again, some voices against the agreement are emerging. So this is where we are in, let's say, in Europe, in a very difficult atmosphere for this agreement. But now let's listen to our speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have here our Deputy, uh, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs from Uruguay, Nicolas Albertoni. I would ask him first uh, how he sees the current scenario. As you know, Uruguay has been one of the key players that has been pushing for several years, President Lacalipo in Uruguay pushing for this deal to be, you know, reached. So, uh, Deputy Minister, please tell us how do you see the current scenario? Uh, how do you see the hope that we might have a deal? Please. Hello, Luis. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So, thank you so much for, for this time for, to have this great conversation. And this is very important for the two regions beyond all the, 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 the specific features we're going to talk about in these few minutes. And please let me know that the minutes we have to talk, I'm, I'm happy to, to pause in any time, and then we can continue the conversation, you know, through, through questions if you have. Um, but, uh, but first of all, I think it's, it's, we are in a, in a very important situation between our regions, because once again, I think it's, it's important to sometimes in a time, you know, to have this bilateral and regional conversation is very productive for both of us to sort of, you know, like um, sometimes refresh the agenda of two very important regions in the world. I would like to say hi to, to the rest of the panel. I have very good friends there, and I would love to be there with you guys. But of course, and indeed, this is a very important day because we have a, at 5 p.m. in Uruguay time, we have, again, because the negotiation and the conversation are still going on, we have, again, intra-Mercosur negotiators and conversation at 5 p.m. And probably next week, we're going to have a, a conversation between our counterparts in Europe. So still, you know, we have some moves between the two regions, although your, um, your summary, and uh, Luis, was, was great. I think I, I don't have nothing to say in terms of, you know, the summary and how was the, how were, you know, the different steps we have already in this short history or long history, given that, you know, we started this conversation 20 years ago. But in this refresh of the conversation, I think we have, and um, you, you very clearly, you know, define the different steps we were in um, through. Um, I would like to say, first of all, <clears throat> that um, we achieved in this last refresh of the conversation, a very good position between our two regions to show that both of us, in a context of high uncertainty, in a context of high protectionism around the world, and also in a context of high interconnectivity in terms of trade and economics, when we are in a very similar position. And I would like to highlight the positive side of the story and not just the negative side, because we have so many things to say on the negative side, but let's start thinking you know, about the positive side. And the main outcome 
of this refresh of the conversation in the last year, because it was like almost two years that we were like sort of refreshing this conversation, we can see that we are in similar positions of the perspective of the world. Because what we see now, now in terms of the limitation to conclude the agreement, indeed we could say that it's granular given the big agreement it has in front of us. Of course, we know, and with Sandra, we studied about this and many times ago, how you know the different positions of different sectors would have a, a very important role in this context. From a Latin American perspective, we would like to say that all the receptions we have seen, you know, <clears throat> of some of the countries, it's a problem, but not that much, because our main interlocutor, our main counterpart, is the commission that has the mandate, the, the mandate of negotiating the agreement. So <clears throat> it's here in Latin America and Mercosur, we also have some rejections of some sectors talking about the agreement. But anyway, we continue the negotiations. Our part of the negotiation in Mercosur is different because we don't have a, a common commission negotiating and, and having the voice of the four countries. The four of us has, have negotiators, you know, and during the process, but in the case of the European Union, we know that the Commission and their negotiators that our, are our key counterpart. Because it's in, imaginable to see, you know, it's something that we could expect in a process that given that we are talking about 27 countries, some of you guys would have some rejections in this process. So I would like to highlight all these rejections that it's something that we could expect in this process, but at the level of the main counterpart, that is the committee the negotiation union, we have that the main outcome is that in this refresh of the negotiation, we are in a very similar position of the perspective of the world in terms of trade and economics. That's the first thing I would like to say. Thank you, Liz, to mention that Uruguay since the beginning was a key defender of the agreement. We said when when the press asked me, when are you expecting to conclude the agreement? I said yesterday. We are prepared to conclude the agreement literally yesterday. We think that there is no much to add to the text we have already. And, and also from a, a perspective from Uruguay, and when we talk about environmental issues, tell me, and I would like to say that, you know, we are, and of course, it's, you know, putting in context, we are ready to or help many European um, countries, given that we are talking from, in my country, of, of 96% of the energy in my country is renewable of the system. So it's not a problem for us talking about environmental issues. Indeed, we are a big defender of that agenda around the world. We know that the European Commission, European Union in general, is expecting to have the Paris Agreement as an essential element of the, of the text, something we, you know, we are open to that consideration. We know that deforestation was the key sort of topic in this last part of the negotiation, but to say the truth, sometimes these big titles ending up to be excuses, not from the European side, but from both sides of the, or, or the sectors that are pushing to limit the agreement, because in the end, we know that we are in a very, common position in terms of deforestation. How important is for, I'm not talking from another government right now, but you know, we know that Brazil, this is, as Sandra could tell you know more about this, how important is this agenda? And in terms of, you know, the deforestation and all what we know that happened in the closed past few, the past, you know, time in, in Brazil in terms of deforestation. So we know that there is an openness to, to solve these problems we have. And that indeed, I will not talk about problems because, you know, considering the big agreement we have in front of us, there are minimal things. Deputy Minister, maybe we, we, you could have 30 seconds just to conclude because we need yeah, to please. advance. Please. Yes. Please. And what we need to, to the last, you know, and I least to track that eliminates the political, you know, substance. And it's, I think, in the political arena, not more in the political and neutral side, because we are convinced and we are very close to concrete. And one last, last uh, 30 seconds. I would like to say that we normally talk about the trade effects of this, but we have to start considering the geopolitical effect of non-signing the agreement in this context. We are in front of a very uncertain time and two very good friends regions that after 20 years are not concluding the agreement, let me tell you that it's a big negative side for the rest of the world. 
Thank you very much. So, sort of optimism that we might, <laughs> if we keep pushing, we might get somewhere. Um, just a small note, reminding everyone that when the, the agreement was reached in principle in 2019, there was already a trade and sustainability chapter inside the agreement. So that also uh, asked the countries to, let's say, to adapt and to respect the, 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 the Paris Climate Agreement. So it is there from the beginning. Uh, but now, uh, so uh, it's kind of optimistic that we, we, we can keep working. There are some positive signs as well. Uh, Eleonor Catella from Business Europe, uh, how does, let's say, the European uh, business sector sees the agreement? Uh, as you know, like the, it's been a rough path, 25 years. Uh, reminding also everyone that in 2019, when the agreement was reached in principle, uh, and then suddenly there was major rejection of the agreement, at the same time, the European Union signed an agreement with Vietnam. And there was no rejection whatsoever, you know, that we had an agreement with a communist single party country. No rejection whatsoever. But Mercosur suddenly, for climate concerns, that was an issue. So, uh, Eleonora Catella, how do you see from the business perspective, how do you assess the situation? Is the agreement, let's say, positive for, for, the, the, for the, the, the business companies, for the business sector in Europe? How do you assess it, please? In a very positive way. That's the very short answer. It was interesting for me to listen to the, you know, the ups and downs in the negotiation process that you have uh, highlighted at the beginning throughout the 25 years. The business uh, community has always consistently supported this agreement. Um, and I remember when at some point the negotiations restarted after a moment of, uh, of uh, stall, let's say in 2016, 2017, and uh, some of our members were, um, we're just uh, asking themselves, is this too good to be true? Are we really restarting? Because they all really wanted it. So they, we have uh, a very consensual position on this from uh, member federations, both in southern countries, those that, those that have uh, stronger cultural, uh, uh, historical relationships uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the four countries of Mercosur, but also from the Nordic countries, I'm thinking of uh, Sweden, Denmark. Um, we see three main benefits in the agreement. The economic value of the agreement itself, the geopolitical aspect, as also the Deputy Minister has uh, highlighted, and the sustainability perspective. So, in terms of economic, this is the biggest agreement that, uh, um, that the EU has uh, been this close to see concluded. We have two big blocks. We have 260 million uh, in market in, uh, in the Mercosur country. So it's a big market. It's a market with a lot of potential and it's a very close market. If you consider a lot of sectors that are important for the economy, you have high tariff peaks that go up to 35% in consumer products, also in pharmaceuticals in some cases. You have uh, um, difficult uh, custom procedures, uh, rules, uh, transparency, there are a lot of aspects that can be improved with an agreement in place. Uh, public procurement opportunities throughout the agreement, uh, you have chapters that would unlock benefits for European companies, even though we already have a presence in the region, because this is something that people say, well, you're already there. Yes, but the untapped potential is, is huge. Um, and uh, it's something that we wouldn't have uh, the possibility to unlock in a different way than, it, than with an agreement. And very quick follow-up question then. So what's happening in Ireland, in Germany, in France, in Poland, in the Netherlands? Why is this business sector not saying this or failing to communicate this? Sometimes so you have uh, domestic policies and the fact that uh, so internal reasons uh, business uh, um, have a problem in presenting this as the priority it is because they don't want to um, have a backlash. They don't want to spend too much political capital on, on this. So they, have, uh, um, they are afraid of possible consequences, but they are also now stepping up, I think, because they see the danger of not speaking enough in favor and uh, not having very clear what the benefits actually would be. So um, it's true that uh, with any trade agreement, you need to achieve the right balance for different sectors. It's true that in Europe, we have sensitivities. These have to be recognized and addressed whenever possible. 
um, but at the same time, an agreement is typically something where you have uh, um, benefits in every one of these uh, uh, economic sectors and in every member state. So you need to achieve that balance in order to have the support of the agreement. So in, within each sector, you need to see, even the automotive sector, for example, they have very long phase out uh, um, plan. That is not what we ideally would go for from a business perspective. But yet there are other advantages that make the balance tilt in favor of a support for the agreement. And that you can see in every sector. Something is not ideal, something else makes it very attractive. The overall balance of this agreement is very, very positive. Going to the geopolitical aspect, uh, this is also something that we are very mindful of because competitiveness is not at the forefront of the preoccupations at the moment uh, in the European Union. And we would like to see this much more present. Uh, we are behind, we are exposed to competition, very fierce competition from other economies that are subsidizing their, uh, their economy some very unfair practices or, uh, um, in other cases, a more uh, um, easy way to support their economy through incentives, something that it's more difficult to achieve in the European Union. When we talk about open strategic autonomy, we forget that we depend as, a, as, a, a, as an economic bloc on imports, so we can't close ourselves off because otherwise we can't sustain our digital transition, our green transition, we need inputs, we need, um, we need imports. Sometimes we think of free trade agreements just for the exports. That not, that's really not the case. We also need imports at a, at, a, at a sustainable price and we need uh, options for um, exports, for our market access. This has been very painfully exposed during the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. And you said, wake up call. Indeed, these are uh, things that have been uh, very, very evident uh, with the recent crisis. How many dependencies we, do we have? And the real strategy to address these is diversification. I will stop here. Thank you. So now from Brazil, Sandra Rios. Uh, Brazil is one of the key mm -hmm. players here, one of those who can really push for the agreement to really reach to a final positive conclusion. Uh, President Lula, from the beginning of his third mandate has been saying that we are going for it. At the, mean, the meantime, he, had, he made some trips to China to put some pressure, saying that we still prioritize the relationship with the European Union. But, you know, if that doesn't happen, maybe we have other options. What's the thinking in Brasilia at this moment? How do you see what's the perspective? Well, thank you very much, Luis. Thank you for remembering to invite me to, to this panel. Thank you uh, to the Martin Center for having me here. Uh, I would remember that uh, during the campaign, Lula made some critical uh, comments on these negotiations, uh, mentioning that uh, maybe it would jeopardize the reindustrialization or the new industrialization as they like to, to call it in Brazil right now, and that the agreement uh, would uh, leave uh, lack of policy space for using existence government procurement as an instrument of industrial policy. Uh, he also uh, complained that uh, Europe was willing to negotiate an additional agreement on trade and, and sustainable development and his election would be sufficient to guarantee that the protection of Amazonia would be back and he had already done it before, so he would do it again, we would recover uh, uh, deforestation um, combat commitments. So there is this kind of critical approach to, to the negotiations. But I guess that President Lula is a very pragmatic uh, uh, character and since the beginning of his government he decided to continue negotiations. He asked his team to make specific demands on government procurement, some adjustments, I guess that nothing that could not be negotiated. At the same time, I guess that there was a, a, a better understanding of the additional instrument that Europe was uh, proposing. And I must say that I don't see anything so complicated in that uh, additional uh, uh, instrument. 
it's just a clarification of the trade and development uh, chapter, trade and sustainable development chapter of the agreement that has, was already negotiated. So I guess that there is a kind of uh, cooperative mood in, in the Brazilian government uh, regarding the, the negotiations. And the, the second point uh, related to business. In the beginning of these negotiations, the late uh, 90s, uh, we saw the Brazilian industry a kind of reluctant uh, 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 regarding this negotiation, kind of uh, concerned about the risks of competition, of opening the domestic market to, to European companies. And, and on the other hand, the agribusiness sector very enthusiastic about these negotiations. What uh, happened during these 20 something years was that agribusiness is oriented to the Asian markets it's not very much concerned about these negotiations because we are speaking of some quotas uh, that are not so relevant for the Mercosur commodity exporters or meat exporters or, and so on. Um, Mercosur already exports more than the quotas that were offered. So in terms of quantities, this agreement will, won't mean uh, uh, nothing very uh, special. But on the other side, Brazilian industry began to, to be interested in this agreement. And I guess that this is due to the fact that Brazilian industry sees this agreement as a gateway to a better uh, international integration of, of Brazil. Brazil, as you know, is a very closed e economy. Uh, I, Leonora has already mentioned some of the figures of our uh, tariffs and, well, have no tariff uh, uh, issues as well. And uh, these negotiations would open a way to the opening up of the Brazilian economy with a partner that is very complementary to, to the Brazilian economic structure. If I may ask, is it a priority? Or if it doesn't happen, it's not an issue? No, How it is, I, I would say that it is a priority. It, it is uh, as a priority that the National Confederation of Industry puts it in all its documents, etc. It's not that uh, if it doesn't happen, uh, a, a big problem will happen in Brazil. It's just an opportunity that is lost. But as you mentioned, uh, China, uh, there is no support in Brazil uh, to any trade negotiations with China because there is this feeling that we would not be able, Brazilian industry would not be able to compete with China. This is a matter of uh, discussion between Brazil and Uruguay that has already announced its intention to negotiate with, with China. I have my own views on that. I think that Uruguay should be free to negotiate its own agreements due to the fact that we have not been able to, 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 to show results in this uh, free trade negotiation, but this is my own opinion. Thank you very much. So you brought up China. Uh, now I ask Mr. Lopez Isturiz, uh, Tono, if you may, uh, for many years as Secretary General of the PP, you have been bringing this topic, you know, the geopolitical vision. Uh, Latin America, all Latin American countries has, have as their main trade partners China. Uh, as a Secretary General, we have, you have pushed for internal papers in DPP about the importance of striking trade deals, working closely, for example, uh, with the Cabinet of Vice, uh, Vice President of the Commission, Dombrovskis. But you also are a very straightforward man, and you can feel the atmosphere. Uh, how do you see this agreement? Is it going to take place? Uh, is it good for Europe at this moment? Please, enlighten us. Um. My words of frustration that you will hear come from the fact that I started even before that. In 1999, while you were a teenager, not me, I was already 29, <laughs> a, I was assistant to the Prime Minister of Spain, Jose Maria Aznar, and it was the first priority. You have to understand, many of you, that uh, Spanish MEPs and Portuguese MEPs 
are very dedicated to this, and they are always in the European Parliament trying to help in this matter. Uh, it's normal. Uh, the French have, uh, you know, they speak more about Africa. The Germans, they speak about everything. Uh, the Italians also about Africa, you know. But there is this, let's say, uh, and, uh, and the Spanish and Portuguese, we are very dedicated for obvious historical reasons, nothing to do with post-colonialism and nothing about that. The difference at that time in 1999 when all started is that we had the so-called um, Ibero-American meetings uh, between Portugal, Spain, and the Latin American countries. And there was big, big cohesion in the decision making. And that was very helpful. Today is not the case. Today, unfortunately, like everywhere else, no one is safe. It's all about uh, populism, ideology, headlines. Uh, everything is about now, not in one year, but today. Uh, in this panorama, uh, let me say that uh, I, as a politician, I would not survive if I'm not optimist. So I share your optimism. I will never cease to have it, but we are confronted uh, with a very difficult scenario. Again, I don't know what forces behind are operating uh, to dissolve this much needed agreement for Europe. Still, there are some Europeans that they think that, you know, we own the world, uh, that, uh, you know, that we are the center of the world. Still, they have not understand that we are not, that we are an economical power, but we are not at the center of things. And many Europeans, still, we don't understand this. And we are letting now escape the opportunity to have the whole Latin American, you know, uh, it's not only about Mercosur. But there's the, the, the deal with Mercosur is a sign for the whole continent. So, guys, you prefer, I mean, it's easier to go to with China. Why? Well, because of climate change, because Monsieur Macron is not happy, because, uh, you know, there is a stream right or whatever, you know, populist in Brazil, and, uh, and then now it's in Argentina. And what about you, Monsieur Macron? Who is going to substitute you if you continue like this? Madame Le Pen. Then to whom you are going to give lessons? Now we are all crying, the extreme right is rising. The extreme right is coming to the European Parliament. And no one is doing the question, why? Because there's no leadership. Because there's no leadership for take decisions like this. This action with the Mercosur needs leadership. And there are no leaders around, I'm sorry to say. Monsieur Mitterrand, Helmut Kohl, Angela Merkel, it's over. The panorama today is what it is, ladies and gentlemen. I have the optimism that they tell me that when you reach bottom, leadership appears. Okay, it seems that still we have not found this bottom, but uh, it's better soon to arrive. Because if not, we are losing billions in taxes, saving taxes, in uh, enterprises, in business, and uh, nearly for the next 10 years, one, billion, one million uh, jobs. Because in Balunia, it's not only about uh, farmers. There are enterprises in Balunia. Big news huh, for the Balunians, huh, Parliament. We have, there are enterprises there that are making a living out of the commerce with uh, South American countries. But no one is telling them. This is also part of the problem. No one is explaining to them. If instead of taking the short way, like Macron, and saying no, no to the, uh, no to the enlargement to the Balkans, no to the Mercosur. I remember in the old times, if someone would say that, he would be called an anti-European. But nowadays, uh, he speaks very well, he has a fantastic image, you know. Uh, what are the problems that have been solved? None. And then you have the results. Bologna, again, I'm saying, you know, it's not only Bologna, it's not only Spain, it's Germany, it's France, everybody has, you know, is going to lose with this. But no one is explaining. Because there is no time, because no one wants to hear explanations. 
because it's better the headline. It's the one minute show. And then, you know, for a traditional boring politician like me, it's hard to compete with all these crazy guys that I have around now, shouting and having all the headlines in the media. That the Mercosur agreement is going to sack the farming industries in, in Europe and so on. It's all, it's, 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 you know, I mean, I don't know how to say it. No one has explained by the other way. No one has had the courage to explain what are the positive points benefits, opportunities for us Europeans, which are, by the way, larger than for them. I hope, I don't know if the minister is listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's true. But no one has explained. Thank you, Tom. People are not guilty, by the way. I'm not saying people are not guilty. It's us. That we are hiding, we are not explaining, and people react that way. And even they vote extreme right. I hope that we have time enough to make them change opinion uh, and that Macron will go in prime time in French TV also to explain the good things that might come about with this. And then for the French people to select clearly what is the option. Thank you, Tono. And I'll open to questions very soon in one minute. Just a very quick follow-up question, Tono. For a long time here in Brussels, people have been saying that even though there is this rejection from the member states in the parliament, if we would have the agreement today, it would pass. Do you feel that at this moment? <laughs> now, how do you see it? And right now, we have elections, Luis, uh, in June. <laughs> um, I would be, I mean, I, I would try not to have the vote before the elections right now. Uh, I can only... I can only imagine the debate uh, before that. Uh, you could imagine my friends from the Greens with their T-shirts and, uh, you know, flags. Uh, no, I will, we'll have to wait. Okay. If, if we can, I don't know if we are on time. We have to wait a little bit. Huh? Thank you very much. So now we'd like to open to the floor to your questions. Maybe you have some concerns. Please don't be shy. Are there any questions, technical, political, geopolitical, about this topic? Very short comments are possible as well. Any questions? Otherwise, I have some. But please, you have heard enough of me. So please, gentlemen here. Here, the second row. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Günther Martis. I'm working for a clear team and we work on a sustainable society for the future. The question here, allow me a short remark, is just trust. We were talking before, in the panels before, about trust. <coughs> the whole negotiation for me as a simple citizen on Mercosur is completely, I'm sorry, intransparent. You are right. We are not, ex we are not getting the, the real explanations. So how can Politicians expect that a simple citizen like me, and believe me, I am now in this year living 20 years in Brussels and I've been working here in several positions. How can we trust that really what you just said or what everybody's telling us, and there are hundreds of opinions, how can we continue with that? Thank you. I think this is a question for Tono. Maybe there are other questions. Uh, that's why, that's why we created the speech and candidat. That was a very humble, you will see the connection. There was, it was, what was the speech and candidat about? That is now dead, by the way. Uh, it was the procedure. Hmm? Uh, it was a humble approach for the European citizens to, through their political vote, to have an impact in the election of the president of the commission. Okay, that was the narrative. Very humble because we were not based in any clear, you know, uh, law, re regulation, you know. It was an idea to, uh, let's say, bring political debate. And through the political debate, explain to people. That's no longer the case. Hmm? Uh, we will have a speech and candidates uh, and soon uh, from all the parties. We already have news and so on no, about it. But uh, it will not be the same. And these are the ones, diplomats and civil servants, that they said no. That they are, you know, they live very well in these negotiations 
from uh, six, o six o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock in the morning in the council, you know, uh, that no one knows anything about, that we only know because afterwards all the prime minister go to uh, press conferences saying how well was the negotiation, no losers, never. And no one knows what's going on. This system, to my humble opinion, cannot be maintained. You are absolutely right. This, then but suddenly this Macron answer. gets out, Macron gets out and says, no, the other, yes. And what's going on? No one knows. And especially for our colleagues in, in Latin America, it doesn't give an, a good, quite a good impression huh, from the Europeans. Huh? And our divided opinions about not only Mercosur, about many things. Thank you, Tono. Peter Hefele has a question. Yes, uh, this morning we talked about the transatlantic relations and the trade issue, so let's triangulate a bit. Uh, I'm very much interested, of course, on the repercussions on the Latin American, North American relations and the wider geopolitical consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <coughs> Anyone wants to respond to that? I think maybe, yeah. I, yeah, I can take the question. Um, I was highlighting just earlier also the, the geopolitical aspect and uh, the competition we are exposed to. Even if we consider the critical raw materials, which is, uh, for example, a, a key aspect of the Net Zero Industry Act and what we are trying to do to boost our industrial basis and to have a stronger and more competitive industry, Chile and Argentina are the second and the fourth uh, um, producers and they have the, the largest reserves in the world of these materials. Where are they going though, these materials once they are extracted, all to China for processing? We are talking 42% of the lithium extracted in Argentina goes to China for processing. And the European Union at this, at, at this time is trying to build partnerships with countries, with countries that we don't have an FTA with. That, uh, the agreement with Mercosur would be a way to establish uh, a way to, uh, to have critical raw materials in, uh, in Europe, to build a sustainable investment there, to help also have a long-term relationship between the two sides. We know that uh, other countries are not interested in a long-term investment that brings benefits also to the recipient countries. So I think there is uh, an opportunity there to develop uh, a mutually beneficial partnership that goes beyond what we have now, that is also beneficial for, for the European industry in what we want to achieve in terms of uh, green transition and digital transition. And this also helps us uh, establishing a more egalitarian partnership with the United States, for example, and not being only a recipient of a line from, that is dictated from the United States, but we come from a, a known position and where we have more equal partners, where uh, in terms of uh, economic security or uh, relations with the third countries, we are uh, um, more in a position to, uh, to debate what is the common interest there. Uh, we know that, uh, that we have uh, also this, uh, this um, problem as, uh, we, as we go forward uh, in, uh, in our uh, transatlantic relationship, depending on what files we're discussing. Think of economic security, for example, that is one, or expo controls. So I think this uh, um, building partnerships with like-minded countries, with partners that want to also develop uh, along standards uh, that are higher than uh, we would have otherwise, I think they all have to be pursued given the geopolitical fragmentation and the increasing rivalry that we see at the moment. Thank you. Deputy Minister Albertoni um, and also Sandra Hughes, uh, Tono talked a little bit about these mixed signals, you know, and that maybe confuses our partners across the Atlantic and maybe gives a sense of, uh, let's say, frustration. Uh, for example, a couple of weeks ago, uh, once Macron came out saying that the agreement was not going to take place, then um, Dombrovskis, Vice President Dombrovskis came and said, no, we are still negotiating this. And then suddenly, uh, Shevchovit came and said, no, no, now it's not the time really. So these mixed signals. Uh, you came with a positive, uh, let's say, optimistic approach. Uh, but it's true that you have given a lot of concessions in this. Uh, is this somehow frustrating for you? And if this doesn't happen, do you think this could have some repercussions for Mercosur, considering that, let's face it, since 1991, in terms of 
closing trade deals with other blocks and partners, it's being not very efficient, let's say like this. Maybe uh, answer in two minutes, if possible. Yes, very good question, Luis. Um, you know, first of all, I think the mixed messages we, we heard from Europe is something that, of course, is having some effect in, in, in this part of the, the Atlantic. Because we have, as, as countries, you know, we have limited time. And when we talk, when we start talking about China, it's not a threat to Europe. It's because we have limited time and we, can, we have to continue exporting. We have to continue having market access. So if for 20 years, a very good friend, we are sending signals that we have to, we want to continue the conversations. And we, you know, every time is a deja vu that every sort of semester or year and sort of the similar situation come up is something of course frustrating and i would like to say to the european side and you know this like more academic debate conversation we are having and this is a very very balanced agreement let me tell you the truth you know from a mercosur side we gave a lot already and we think that you know gave a lot of, so it's a very balanced agreement with some that we were studying for so many times in different agreements and if we see the grander part of this agreement, I would like to really highlight that this is a very balanced agreement. And the worst case scenario, given this like sometimes not clear messages we receive, is that the worst case scenario is not having a text that give us a framework of how we want to follow these regional relations. Because when we in Europe and you know talk about deforestation, okay, the worst case scenario is not having a framework of how we want to work on that problem. And the last thing coming from the political side, and I will conclude with this, that and I would like to say, you know, Antonio for, for the words he said, because sometimes you know we think we see in, in panels colleagues that say things that given the role we have, we could not say the same, you know, from our position. But, um, but thank you, Antonio, for the words. And it's, it's interesting to see that from the political side you know, of Europe, and this is the only thing I, I will say politically from another side, and we see that always is about like and criticizing the agreement, very general, but no one is giving recommendations on how we can have a better agreement. This is not the political debate we were looking for, you know, and, and I would say that in the Mercosur side, it's a matter of a month that most of the parliaments that are waiting to have this signed agreement could be ratified. I would talk this from the four, most of the four of us, for sure my parliament, you know, could be a matter of a month that this could, this could be ratified. So it's really a pity, you know, and in this moment of balance that we are, these mixed messages we have from, I think from the European side, of course, are not helping to, to, to have a, a better and a concluded agreement. And Sandra, uh, I remember 20 years ago in a conference in Brazil, uh, you were representing the Conf National Conference of Industry in Brazil, and you were saying 20 years ago, now we are not achieving anything. Uh, this common market idea of Mercosur is not working. Let's become a free trade uh, area and let's drop it. Let's let everyone to negotiate their agreements. Uh, in Brazil, do you see this sense of frustration? Because leading, reading, by reading the press in Brazil, it seems that they don't care too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> please, tell You're us. You're right. <laughs> You're right. I guess that uh, that has been my, my opinion since that time. Uh, we were not able to work in the deepening of the customs union of Mercosur. We have lots of flaws uh, related to um, uh, exceptions in the common external tariffs, special import regimes, and these special import regimes are increasing, not decreasing. So we are, we ha we are an increasingly imperfect customs union with this idea that we have to negotiate in common, in block, with other partners. Um, and I guess, I, I, I guess that the frustration, uh, the Uruguayan frustration with this model uh, is there for a long time. Uruguay is the member that complains about this, this, this process. And I guess that we would better work in uh, perfectioning the uh, free trade area of Mercosur uh, and realize that we, we've been not able to uh, work as a customs union. In fact, so why 
maintain this uh, appearance. You know? I, I, I understand that for foreign policy reasons, for policy, foreign policy matters, it's good to negotiate as a bloc, but it can uh, mean that uh, the members are stuck to this, uh, in this process without uh, uh, freedom to go and negotiate if they are able to negotiate with, with other partners. So, yes, I have, I think that we went in the opposite way in this, in this period. We continue to work as if we were a customs union, which we are not, uh, and we've not been able to, to, to improve our network of uh, trade agreements. That is why I believe that closing this deal with the EU would be so beneficial to Mercosur, because Mercosur needs a kind of push of modernization, and uh, the agreement with the EU would mean that we would have to make movements inside Mercosur. If we look what happened in the second uh, term of 2019, right after the interim agreement was announced, uh, it's astonishing. Uh, during the second semester of 2019, Mercosur was able to negotiate three or four internal agreements that were there for a long time, uh, a trade facilitation agreement, improvements in the automotive uh, agreement, improvements in government procurement, improvements in intellectual property. This was made possible by the fact that the agreement with, with the EU was announced and we would have to catch up with the, the, the rules that were negotiated already with, with the Europe. So oh. this would be an extra benefit that the EU Mercosur deal would bring to Mercosur. No, I ask you because this is an important aspect as well. If we don't have a deal, we also have some responsibility to bear if this process that we have been supporting since the 90s of Mercosur from the European perspective might, you know, crumble, you yeah. know, to some, to, to some extent. I don't know if there are any other questions I'll ask. Yes, there are three questions, so please mm -hmm. go ahead. And then we will move the three final questions and then we will move to final remarks. Yeah, my name is Richard Schenk from MCC Brussels and I want to bring up the farming issue again because what we have in Europe, why this is such a sensitive issue is because the environmental and climate and animal welfare regulations have spot European farming in so, so a very hard, between rock and hard place. So we already have farms that are dying, where they, the next generation is not taking over. And on Monday, the Belgian presidency of the council mentioned that uh, they expect to decline agriculture production by 10, 15% in the next, uh, next decades in result of the so-called Green Deal. So uh, everybody is calling for, so for mirror clauses with Mercosur. And uh, so the South American countries should mirror these, these regulations in, um, within, within, in their own agricultural sector. And I just can't imagine that the South American countries would do that um, because they want to export. So the whole free trade agreement is about exporting their own products to Europe. So maybe the two South American panelists could com comment on this. Thank you so much. So, uh, Deputy Minister Albertoni, please uh, be ready to answer <coughs> this question. Reminding that the Minister of Agriculture of Spain, uh, Planas, yesterday he was also saying in the press that he supports these mirroring cla clauses. Second question, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Linson. Uh, may I ask uh, Antonio a question regarding uh, the Spitzenkandidat? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Why not? It's the final, final <laughs> panel, so let's go for it. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yes, um, I think that the uh, Spitzenkandidat procedure is, uh, let's say, a pseudo-democratic procedure because, I mean, the uh, parliamentary groups don't exactly uh, represent 500 million European citizens. Uh, why? Because I'm also running for the EU elections. Um, so so um, why isn't it possible for the um, citizens um, to directly uh, elect the next European Commission president? Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, now final question, please, just 30 seconds, because then we have to start <coughs> moving towards the end. Andrea Castagna, I have a question for Deputy Minister Albertoni. I will be yeah. very quick. I don't want to talk about uh, current Mercosur members, but a former Mercosur member, because uh, I think uh, another elephant in the room, since we're talking today about elephants in the room, is Venezuela. I'm reading growing, uh, worrying news about the situation in Venezuela, and the situa not only about the social context in the country, but about the fact that uh, they are putting troops with the border, uh, on the border with Guyana. And it's something that here in Europe we don't really talk about. We don't talk about Venezuela. We don't talk about this issue at all, at least. Uh, in the political discourse, and I was wondering, what's the situation there in uh, Latin America? What, what's the situation? Do we have to be worried about that? Uh, what's the mood there? Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Deputy Minister Albertoni, two questions. I'll ask you to please be very short, if possible. A very okay, short yeah. comment on the mirror clauses, and if you want to add something on Venezuela. And Tono, please, very short on Spitzenkandidat, because then we can keep the discussion during coffee. So, please, Deputy Minister Albertoni. Now, not easy to answer these two very important questions, you know, in, in 30 seconds. But anyway, we just have three minutes. Like, so please. Um, yes, no, but the, um, first of all, you know, the, in terms of the, the last question that we, we heard about Venezuela, of course, we are following very closely what is happening there. Uh, Venezuela was in a sort of difficult position in Mercosur because it's suspended given the democratic situation that they, they are they're facing. Uruguay is convinced, you know, that they, given the context of the elections that they, this regime is promoting, this is not in the context of a democracy. There are candidates, you know, that could be part of the election that they are not there, so this, they are limiting and limited, you know, and, they, and restricting, you know, candidates to, to be in the election. This is clearly not part of the value we are looking for in a democracy. So this is why Venezuela, you know, is suspended, not only for Uruguay reasons, you know, but also for, um, for, for in terms of the negotiation, also is not participating, you know, in the negotiation, but this is something, of course, from a European perspective to follow closely because, and of course, it's part and a very important part of, of the region. It's a, it's, a, it's a country, of course, with a very important role also in the region if they can solve this democratic um, uh, issue. On the agricultural side, and that the, another member of the panel, uh, sorry, of the, uh, of, of the audience, you know, asked about, um, I think it's, it's something that we could expect, you know, that then agricultural and also the energy sector and the environmental sector and are pushing, you know, to have a better agreement on that. But once again, we know that the preferences of these sectors always will be pushing to have a better agreement and limiting the agreement in some sense. Different to the business sector of Europe, that we have a colleague there that just said that since the beginning of this refresh of the conversation was very positive on agreements. But we have to see in the environmental and agricultural side, what would we have to write together? For example, something we were considering the negotiation table is green hydrogen. It's something that we, you know, could be one of the outcome if we have an agreement, how we can deal or have a, a similar regulation of green hydrogen. So let's see on the infinite agenda we could have if we have an, an agreement and rather than not having an agreement that, you know, will be all, all the conversation will be passed. And I think this will be problematic once again, given that the Western countries have to show ourselves together, given the context of uncertainty we are all in, facing in, in the international arena. Thank you very much. Tono, Spitzenkandidat. I know the answer. I know you can do it in 20 seconds. So. <laughs> uh, and first of all, sorry to our Latin American colleagues. Uh, it's a very internal thing, but OK. Uh, but the question, as a politician, I have to answer everything. And this is a very good question, by the way. Uh, Pseudo-democratic figure. But I think it was more democratic than ambassadors and top civil servants in Brussels deciding who's going to be the next president of the European Commission. I think that uh, I learned from late President Martins. Martins said? <laughs> I learned not to, uh, to be very respectful and uh, patient with the decisions that we have to take, at, you know, to create, to consolidate this project. Constitution, the failure of the European Constitution was a fair demonstration that if you take two steps forward, societies, European societies are not so keen to accept it. So we have to go. A speech and candidate, I'm telling you, it was a humble first stone of the building 
of having finally the president of the commission being elected directly by the citizens. That was the aim, that was the ambition. But claro, with European list, that candidate should be in a European list. Uh, still, there is a long time for a citizen of Gothenburg to vote for a candidate from Toledo, or the one from, uh, from Sicily to vote a candidate from Finland, okay? <coughs> uh, we were starting a process. We will not forget about it. We will continue in this battle uh, to give that political debate. So, again, things like this debate about Mercosur are properly explained by people that are elected, elected, that is the aim, of course, and that are, have to give explanations to people. That's what politicians are for. The people that are now doing these decisions, they are not used to give explanations in media, except for leakings in Politico, maybe, uh, which is here in this city, uh, uh, happy time for everybody, but for people that really they don't have to face the media front page every day to give explanations about what's going on. And that is the humble approach that uh, we, we will keep fighting for. Thank you, Tono. So now just a final, final round to our speakers. You can answer in 15 seconds, please. Mm. Uh, after what we discussed here, so what do you see, what are the prospects? And we'll start with Nicolas Albertoni. Pessimism or cautious optimism? Just choose one about EU Mercosur. Positive. As a politician, you know, every, everything, you know, we have to continue until, you know, we really will see the end. And we're still having conversation that I, I would like to say the truth. We're still having conversation. And of course, the, the parliament elections, I know what, ha what would happen in June could change the dynamics. But we are still having conversation, the post regions, Mercosur will have a meeting in a few hours. And we're still having hope. Thank you. Eleonora Catella, please. Also cautious optimism, and we can't uh, uh, stop hoping that a solution will, will be found that will allow the negotiations to be really finally concluded. Also as a signal to other trading partners with whom we are negotiating, because the trade agenda of the European Union doesn't end uh, here. Mercosur is one of the most important agreements, the most important agreement we are grappling with at the moment, but we also hope to see more in the future, and we need to send a, a positive message that the EU is able to conclude agreements and ratify them. Yeah, after the failure of TTIP and 10 years after the signature of CETA without ratification still, it's an important debate as well. Mm. Sandra Rios. Very cautious optimism. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to say that uh, I'd rather have the, nego the negotiations open than closed, uh, definitely. So uh, I guess that uh, until we have, uh, while we have the possibility of exchange views and try to try to, to eliminate some of, of the difficulties, uh, although we do not have the political will to close the deal, at least we are uh, discussing and maintaining the, the negotiations open. I think it's better than to decide uh, to close the negotiations without any result. So, Tono. I already said it. Uh, as a politician, I always have to be demonstrate to everybody that I am optimist because I, people have to keep the faith on this. Uh, I am not optimist, but we will keep fighting on. Those who we believe that this is good and that we should explain better to farmers and to people uh, the good uh, things that also this uh, agreement could bring to Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you also to our speakers. Thank you also to the Martin Center for bringing this topic to the debate, which is very important. And I will now give the floor back to Theo, please. <laughs>